rather amazing. And we're gonna see that there's a great variety of life here. This is a great plant. This is water mint. So it actually smells like mint. So it's a lot of fun. And this is gonna bloom next. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna have a succession of blooms. So we're gonna have golden rods uh, here. We're also gonna have a lot of uh, swamp sunflower, which is a beautiful native. All of these are tremendous pollinator plants. So this is what pollinator pathways and pollinator paradise represents with doing nothing. So what we are interested in, how we can mimic nature, learn from nature, and bring nature home and recapture that piece of the wild that's so important to us. Um, look at the, how Mother Nature makes compositions. So if we were to learn how to mimic that, instead of try every, put everything in a neat little place, whether it really belongs in this country or not, how beautiful is that against the swamp rose? Look at, look at that like ruby red, pinkish with the yellow inside of the rose. And again, you'll see so, so many varieties of that. And here's another rare treat. A colony of emerging cardinal flower. Cardinal, Labelia cardinalis. And this is where it wants to grow in nature. And this is why it's so hard to get it to grow in our landscapes, was unless you're planting it in a bog or someplace that's very dependable. So this will come and go as a biennial. And what a beautiful combination. And I didn't plant it. I take no responsibility. But to appreciate it, you don't need to be ego-driven. Here we start to get a, another interesting mix. So we have roses, rose hip. This is kind of a supermarket. I call this area Bounty um, because of the abundance of wildlife. And interesting thing about paths and trails, it creates an edge habitat, which is more favorable to wildlife than the completely undisturbed area. Disturbed areas have value as well. If you go to the high peaks of the Adirondacks, you can't walk, you can't bushwhack even. Um, so the Indians avoided um, the high peaks and the virgin timberlands because you couldn't easily walk through there. And it was not a lot of food, it was not a lot of game. In fact, Adirondack means bark eater in Algonquin. That was the Indians basically subsisted on bark, not, um, not animals. So as we come in here, we see pickerel weed and arrowroot. Some more interesting combination. And this is a down willow that's become a nursery log. So on one side, we see that the willow split. And this is the more mature stand of the nursery log. And this is, becomes vertical. You can cut these branches off, bury them in the ground, and they will do that. And that's used for bioengineering uh, technique called uh, brush mattresses. So you can take these live stakes, live stalks of willow, cut them, put them in the ground, bury them, and they'll grow. And that will substantially um, hold a riparian bank or a river bank. Like a corkscrew burr reed. Very interesting. A lot of them in here. So we have bulrush and some cattails left and all kinds of cool stuff. So this is very much a uh, natural pollinator habitat. So we'll see a variety of adult butterflies, moths, hummingbirds, and so forth here, which means there's lots of caterpillars which are feeding the birds. We're having a nice quiet day here, and you can see the bird excrement on the leaves from somebody roosting right up there. And very important plant to these pollinators, the gorgeous um, flowers of the New York ironweed. 
and even the fleece vine has a purpose here. And look at this combination. Look at this, you know, beautiful combination. There's a ton of little moths and butterflies and wasps and bees and flies and insects all living together here. If we can learn to appreciate the diversity of life, like this bee here, that is necessary for pollinating. As humans, if we can appreciate that and adapt. Of course, so here we have an old apple tree too, that's covered by a grapevine. So we have crab apples, then we have roses, then we have grapes. All of this is part of the bountiful supermarket that is supplied on this island that's surrounded by water. And dirty water at that. Little hummingbird moths. So from sun to shade, constantly evolving and changing, the interior of the pin oak dies. It doesn't get sun anymore. The outer branches still live. They die back, but structurally they're very strong. They're like iron. So here we have tires that float in here. You see bits of the oil and the diesel that is all run off from the roads and the automobile. Uh, repair plants and everything else that creates negative human impact in here. These are our little vignettes. No two microhabitats like microbiome biomes and um, personal biofilm and bacteria. We have signatures and imprints on our body. Our breath is different or whole bodily systems different. We smell different to each other. We exert pheromones and hormones. Plants have exudates to give off different chemicals to propagate and continue to spread their genes throughout the environment. And they create the possibilities for life. And then climate change, or climate as it were, or weather, or whatever you want to call it, comes in. And that shifts, and that creates another surface energy and power. And then the canopy above. So there's a lot going on below ground, at ground level. From what we can see, that's important to look above and see the architecture and the beauty of the branches and the, the way the light comes in. If you like what you've seen, check out our website, greenjabelandscaping.com.